Throughout the years, we've looked at a lot of great engines on this channel, a lot of amazing engines, a lot of powerful stuff, tons of diesel stuff and so on. But today we're gonna do the exact opposite. We're gonna look at the worst car engines of modern history. There's a little bit of everything in here and the last one will definitely surprise you. So let's get into it. And as a quick preface, I think it is worth mentioning that there's really no good way of quantifying what exactly makes a good engine and what makes a bad engine. And realistically, there are lots of bad engines out there that have loads of problems, such as the BMW N54, but an engine like that has so many pros compared to the cons that it wasn't added to the list. Just about every engine we have on this list has a lot of cons and very minimal pros. So just keep that in mind. And before we get started, definitely drop a comment down below letting me know what you think is the worst engine of all time. And what better place ever than to start this list than with one of GM's biggest failures ever with the Cadillac Northstar V8. Now this engine came out in 1992 when Cadillac got sick of being bullied by just about every German automaker out there with their luxury cars, giving the Cadillac like luxury cars an absolute beatdown and selling like hotcakes. And with this engine, Cadillac's idea was simple. Embrace the future of overhead cams as a superior option to a cam and block engine. And while Cadillac was definitely right that on paper an overhead cam V8 engine is superior to an overhead valve V8 engine, their execution on the idea was well, not fantastic. On paper though, this was super impressive at the time that it came out. With a whopping 295 horsepower and 290 pound-feet of torque from a naturally aspirated 4.6 liter engine. That was about as much power as the Corvette from the same year with its much larger 5.7 liter engine. So what's wrong with this engine you might be asking? Well, everything. Sort of, not really. For one, head gasket failure is extremely common on these engines, which is already a big red flag. And on top of that, oil consumption is alarmingly high. Now for the oil consumption, there was a Cadillac service bulletin going around back in the day that you can still get to this day. And it's a procedure, which is GM's four-step piston ring cleaning procedure that you can still order. There's also issues with the later North Star V8 engines having excessive carbon buildup, causing a knock on cold start, no oil pressure for some of the older engines, leaky rear main seals, and more. Hell, the oil consumption on this engine was so bad that even GM had noted that it was normal for it to consume a quart of oil per 1,000 miles. Absolutely insane. And just as a side note, this engine was one of the award winners by Wards for their you know, best engine of the year or top engine of the year finishers which just highlights how useless that award truly is. And what terrible engine list would be complete without mentioning the six liter power stroke. God, I love hating on this engine and I love seeing boneheads try to defend it. This engine was born out of the need for a newer engine as the 7.3 liter power stroke could no longer meet the emissions and power outputs required for the F250 and F350 to compete with what Dodge and GM were offering with their trucks. Compared to the 7.3, the 6 liter power stroke was a big jump in terms of performance and emissions. A few key features include the four valve cylinder heads, a quick spooling variable geometry turbocharger, a lower voltage and higher pressure version of the HEUI injection system, and a crankcase bed for superb bottom end strength. But none of that really matters in the long run because just about all of those innovations actually became problems. And realistically, the problems start with the EGR cooler, which is known for either clogging or cracking, both of which can easily be misdiagnosed as a head gasket and cause a lot of coolant consumption. Then there's the EGR valve, which is also known for sticking and causing even more issues in the EGR system. Then you have the oil cooler, which can often get clogged with sand that's left over from when the block was cast. And when the oil cooler gets clogged, then it no longer works and your oil gets way too hot. On top of that, there's lots of instances of high pressure oil pump failure, which then means your truck literally won't run because the injectors rely on high pressure oil in order to operate, which is then compounded even further with the low pressure oil pump issues. And worst of all, this engine's high pressure oil system is full of small little o-rings and little gaskets everywhere that can fail and if one of those fails and fails hard enough it will literally cause your truck to not run at best case scenario it'll just cause it to not want to start and on top of all of that the torque to yield head bolts are way too skinny and there's only four head bolts per cylinder and they're fine in totally stock form but nobody leaves their truck in totally stock form and before you know it the heads are lifting and your head gaskets are toast while ford guys are right to say that the six liters issues are made worse when you crank the power up they're wrong to call the detuned international vt365 found in the industrial applications as a reliable engine because those engines still suffer from almost all the same issues oh and by the way this was yet another engine that won a ward's top engine award. Go figures. Sticking with the train of diesel hate, let's look at something old from Oldsmobile. Get it? Because it's an old mobile. Anyways, the Oldsmobile V8 diesel is one of the biggest turds to exist in modern automotive history. And honestly, this engine is so bad that you could partially or even fully blame it 
for diesel engines in cars, just not being popular here in the US as they are in pretty much any other part of the developed world. This engine was named the LF9, and it's a common misconception that this was a compression fueled conversion of the Chevy 350, but this actually isn't true. Rather, it's a diesel conversion of the Oldsmobile 5.7 liter gas V8 engine that Oldsmobile had been using since the late 1940s. Compared to that old gas engine, this new diesel engine had the same bore, stroke, and architecture, but it was about 25 pounds heavier overall because the rotating assembly had to be massively beefed up in order to handle the extra stress of being a diesel engine and not a gas engine. At the time that it was new, it output a whopping 120 horsepower and 220 pound-feet of torque. Every time you think an American-made V8 can't physically make any less power, you'll be blown away to find out that somehow they managed to make yet another engine with even less power. It's an absolute feat, a marvel of engineering, to be able to produce a 5.7 liter engine that only makes 120 horsepower, which is made even funnier by the fact that a few years later, the newer engines had to be detuned for improved fuel economy, which means they only made 105 horsepower. On the bright side though, the LF9 did offer decent fuel mileage during a time when gas prices were out of control relative to the average American's income. And as such, it actually sold decently well, but problems quickly rose to the surface in the form of head gasket leaks, oil pan leaks, corrosion on the fuel injector pumps, water in the fuel, and problems with the three-speed automatic transmission that was often paired with this engine. Luckily, Oldsmobile put this engine out of its misery in 1980 but not after a class action lawsuit filed with the Federal Trade Commission that allowed owners to claim up to 80% of the original cost of the engine in the case of an engine failure. Combine this with the fact that gas had gone back to normal prices and it makes total sense why Oldsmobile very quickly killed off this engine in 1985. Now this next engine I will applaud for its attempted innovation and that's the Cadillac V864 engine. And what makes this engine special is the fact that it had cylinder deactivation. And this is definitely not the first engine to ever have cylinder deactivation because that was actually successfully done all the way back in the early 1900s. But those early engines were just that. They were early engines. They kind of sucked, just as all early 1900 engines do. Which is kind of funny because Cadillac reintroduced the technology in 1981 with this engine and it still kind of sucked. This system was standard on all 1981 Cadillacs and the technology actually came from Eaton and it was installed on the 1980 throttle body injected 6 liter V8 which at its core was just a de-stroked and de-bored 472. This system was designed to shut off either two or four cylinders to increase fuel mileage which you probably were able to figure out by the name of this engine. And the whole thing was controlled by Cadillac's onboard computer, which used sensors to monitor engine speed, EGR, idle speed, intake manifold air pressure, coolant temp, and more. If the computer sensed a sustained cruising condition, so you're just cruising down the road, it would signal to a solenoid activated blocker plate to physically move the rocker arm and turn off specific cylinders, turning your 6 liter V8 into a 4.5 liter V6 or a 3 liter V4 on the fly. And if this system worked properly, you actually saw some pretty decent fuel mileage. But that's the thing right there, that big if. The big problem is that the software needed to run the entire system and monitor all the sensors wasn't actually fast enough to process the information on time to make a decision. There are also press reports of the engine having noticeable hesitation and jolts when the engine deactivated cylinders. And if this was some sort of shit box, I'm sure no one would care. But in a Cadillac, pretty much all of their customers found this straight up unacceptable. And just about all of the V864 engines actually had their cylinder deactivation completely removed or just shut off. So it was a permanent V8 engine. <laughs> That's kind of funny the cylinder deactivation got deactivated. Anyways, couple those problems with the throttle body injection and it's kind of a recipe for disaster. And as a quick side note, I will say GM is still using cylinder deactivation to this day, but they actually got it to work pretty well with their displacement on demand that you'll find on Gen 4 and Gen 5 LS and LT engines. And the Ford guys are gonna hate me for this video. <laughs> All right, the next engines on the list are the 5.4 liter and 6.8 liter Triton engines. But to be fair, the 5.4 had a long run from 1997 to 2014. So it's far from the worst engine on the list but it has some notorious problems that are simply too funny to not talk about. And that problem is the spark plugs ejecting themselves out of the cylinder head at Mach 5 and trying to enter the atmosphere. Now, seriously, those spark plugs went flying. The whole thing is caused by his bad cylinder head design, where on the early two valve 5.4 engines, the spark plug threads were too short and would either result in the threads coming out with the spark plug when they were changed or the force of compression and ignition literally shooting them out of the spark plug holes. So funny story, way back before my YouTube days, I worked at a bicycle shop with my friend Daniel. And this bicycle shop was owned by one guy who happened to live in Tempe, and he had a work van that we got to use when, you know, if we needed to go to a bike show or help a customer out at their house or something like that. So one time we were driving this van around, it was a Ford Econoline, had like 22 or 24 inch wheels on it. But the important part here, 
had the 6.8 liter Triton, we were going down the 101 and it shot a spark plug out and we were about 30 minutes from the shop and we still drove it all the way back to the shop running on nine cylinders with one of those cylinders literally just spraying fuel out into the engine bay. Anyways, that whole spark plug issue was solved, at least to my understanding, when Ford introduced the three valve version of the 5.4 liter, but the introduction of the three valve engine brought with it some issues with the timing chain system, which can result in the pistons and valves violently meeting together. Outside those two major issues, I will say Triton engines aren't absolutely terrible. Uh, they're just kind of gutless and don't really make any power considering their size. And this last engine on the list might surprise you because it's a product from Toyota. That's right, a 1990s Toyota engine made it onto the list of terrible engines, and that's absolutely wild considering how many good engines Toyota produced during the 1990s, and how many of their engines were just flat out overbuilt, over-engineered, and almost flawless. Anyways, this particular engine is actually very close to being a good engine, but the few flaws put it on this list, and that's the 3VZE. On the surface, this is just another over-engineered product from Toyota. It's supposed to be a perfect engine for the 4Runner, and it was the first engine larger than a 4-cylinder to ever be offered in their little SUV. This is a 3-liter single overhead cam V6 outputting 150 horsepower and 180 pound-feet of torque. So what is the problem then? What, what exactly makes it worth being on this list? And that's the head gaskets. Of all the problems an engine can suffer from, this is probably one of the worst. But part of this issue seems to be clouded by the coolant system itself, which is very easy to have air bubbles stuck in as compared to basically any other engine, and is actually often misdiagnosed as a head gasket issue. That being said, after some digging online, I couldn't find a clear answer if the head gasket issue was a problem with the cylinder head design itself or the head gaskets that Toyota had originally used when putting these engines together in the factory. And as a side note, this is one of Toyota's leakiest engines ever. But as a true Toyota guy would say, if it's leaking oil, it still has oil in it. Honestly though, outside the head gasket issue, this is actually a pretty decent engine, pretty reliable. And it's not something I actually wanted to put on this list, but the show has to go on. And some honorable mentions I wanted to include on this list, but I didn't just because I didn't have the time, include the 2.2 liter Mopar engine for being an absolute turd, the four liter Land Rover engine and 4.6 liter engine as well for slipping cylinder liners. That's an absolute joke. And the 5.7 liter Hemi, because basically all they do is knock their entire life. Seriously though, there's a lot of bad engines out there. I could only list so many. So drop your comments down below, letting me know what engines you think are also terrible. And while you're down there, be sure to smash the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Get subscribed so you don't miss out on future videos. Check out some of the other stuff on the channel. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok. We post a lot on there too. And I'll see you guys in the next one.